Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here for LowPost.com and I'm back with a new course that's going to focus on the essentials you need to know to get up and running with Assimilate Scratch. Now if you're unfamiliar with Scratch, it's an application that focuses on conforming, grading, keying, compositing, and much, much more. But even more important than that, Scratch is an application designed to make your daily's workflow a super smooth and super simple process. Now you might be thinking to yourself, why should I learn Scratch or why do I even need it? I'm working pretty good with the application I'm using right now. Well, the first thing that's important for me to point out about Scratch is that it's fast, ridiculously fast. I run into problems these days where I find myself working faster than my NLE or compositing application, which can be a little bit frustrating. Another thing that is truly unique about Scratch is the flexibility it gives you when working with it. You can change any setting, any time even if you're playing back clips in your timeline. You're not limited on monitoring hardware either. You can choose from all the top companies out there, whichever one works best for you. And colorists who work with a grading panel will be glad to know that Scratch supports custom panel remapping. Now, when it comes to dailies, Scratch is the king of metadata, especially when creating dailies for Media Composer editors. Do you need metadata specific to the editor or assistant? Scratch can easily do that. It not only can read all this metadata, but you can then use the metadata for clip burn-in, naming, export file naming, and so much more. All of this plus background rendering. That's right, and to be honest, I never notice a performance hit when I'm rendering in the background. How about ProRes support for Windows? That's right, export ProRes files directly from scratch on your Windows-based machines. Last but certainly not least, the Scratch team offers excellent customer support, and if you need to drop them a line, you know they'll get back to you lightning quick. All right, I've only mentioned a slight few of the tons of great features you'll find when you start working with Scratch. Also keep in mind that Assimilate offers a free trial that you can download right now so you can follow along with the lessons in this course. All right, so at this point, I would normally say something along the lines of, let's command or alt and tab into whatever application we happen to be working with, and let's get started. But as you just saw, in the background while I was talking, I actually launched Scratch, and you're probably thinking, Kev, you had to have made a little edit there or sped something up. There's no way that that application launched that quickly. Well, it did. I'm just gonna come back, I'm gonna launch it again here, and you'll see that literally in a matter of seconds, the application is up and ready to go. I think the only application that I have on my system that opens faster than this is TextEdit. Okay, just to give you an idea of the speed that you're talking about. Now, let's talk a little bit about tech support before we get rolling. I mentioned it in the introduction, and I said that they have an awesome tech support team, and what they've also done is just built in a little bit of tech support troubleshooting for you that you might not even know about that's actually available to you right here from within the standard Scratch interface. So normally when you reach out for tech support, they're gonna ask you questions like, we need to know the version of Scratch you're running, the OpenGL and CL drivers on your system, the version of your operating system, as well as hardware details. So you normally have to go to a few different places to find that. Not in Scratch you don't. All you need to do is to click on the interface towards the top of the screen, you're brought to the system information screen that gives you all of that information right here. Now, chances are the team might want a log file from you as well, so no need to search for it. All you need to do is simply come down to log files. There they all are. Take the ones you want, drag them into an email, click send, all set to go. Let me just close the logs folder. And let's talk about creating a new project. Now, for the purposes of this lesson, I actually already have a project for us to work in called, appropriately enough, Scratch Essentials. But I just wanna show you how the whole process works inside of Scratch. Let's come down, let's create a new project. Now, you'll notice that as of right now, everything is grayed out. And we're just gonna create a project called, appropriately enough, Dummy Project. Now, none of the parameters are going to become available until I say create. Now, you'll notice that you have a few options in here like to get in and set your project paths as well as where you're going to auto export your project metadata when you exit out of Scratch. To be honest, I could spend probably about an hour just talking about this one window right here. But what I want to do is draw your attention to where you're going to set your default image format settings, meaning the raster dimension, the pixel aspect, and the frame rate of your project. Now, this is fairly self-explanatory. You come in, 
you pick the preset that you want, you say OK, you're all set to go. What I want to draw your attention to is making adjustments to any of these parameters. And I'm just going to use the aspect as an example. How you're probably accustomed to adjusting parameters is to get in and enter an absolute value. Let's just enter a value of 3 just for the sake of argument now. Or what you might be accustomed to doing is clicking and dragging left and right. Now you're going to notice the problem with this. You're either hitting the edge of the screen or you're, and I don't normally do this because it drives me a little bit crazy, you're pounding that mouse on the desk as you're trying to get this to move across. And to be honest, it becomes a little bit of a pain because you find yourself constantly going in and entering absolute values. One thing I love inside of Scratch is what I like to call the twirlies. Now what I mean by that is that with any given parameter, I'm just going to set this parameter's value back to 1. If I'd like to make an adjustment to this parameter, I'd like to make it very, very minor, very small, but I don't want to get it and enter an absolute value. What I can do is I can click on the parameter itself and start twirling the mouse in a circle. And you'll notice that what happens is, is that the faster that I twirl, the faster that value goes up. And the slower that I twirl, the slower it goes up. Now the same can also be said in reverse. Now this concept works the same across any and all parameters inside of Scratch and is even easier to do when you're working with a pen and tablet. Okay, Pen and tablet is a fantastic way to work inside of Scratch. Now I'm just going to reset this back to a value of 1. It doesn't really matter what we set this to because I already have my project settings set from the project that we're going to be working on and I'm just going to say OK. Now, let me show you a couple other things. I'm just going to come into my user settings. You'll see we can get in, create as many profiles as we like. The one thing I want to draw your attention to inside of this window is the scheme. You'll see underneath appearance, the scheme is set to color. Many color grade artists out there do not like to work with color in the interface. They want to have minimal color, whether it's on the desktop background, even the color behind the computer, because it's going to impact how they see colors when they're grading. So what you have the ability to do inside of Scratch is simply turn that value to mono. You'll see now everything is in black and white or gray for that matter and now you can get in and grade things exactly the way that they need to be graded. I'm just going to set this back to color because for the purposes of our lessons I want to keep this nice and colorful so I can easily draw your attention to things. I'm just going to say OK. I'm going to come into the system settings where you can get in and set up things like your panels. You can add or remove more formats as well as add and remove more aspects and even get in and set what type of default metadata you'd like when getting into your projects to start working. Last but certainly not least, you also have the ability to get in and set your default notes from within the system settings window as well. What I'm going to do is just come down. I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to delete this dummy project later. I'm going to select Scratch Essentials, I'm going to say Enter Project, and we're now ready to talk about the four main modules you'll work with inside of Scratch. Now I know this window might look a little bit daunting, but bear with me. Once you see how things work inside of Scratch, it actually is a very, very logical and very fluid workflow. Now before we even talk about the construct window, I want to talk about your shortcuts or your hotkeys. Now how do we get access to see what those hotkeys are? Well, let's just use that H in hotkey as our shortcut on the keyboard. I'm just going to hit H to call up our shortcut or our hotkey window. Now you'll see they're spread across five different groupings. The construct grouping, the player grouping, viewport, color effects, and edit. Okay. Now the one that I really want to draw your attention to inside of the construct tab is right down here under navigation. You'll notice that to get to these different modules, you can simply use the F1, F2, F3, and F4 shortcut keys on your keyboard. Now, to be honest, I'm not going to go through any more of these shortcuts because we could be talking about these for hours. But keep those ones in mind, F1, F2, F3, and F4. Now, I'm just going to click anywhere in the interface to turn off our hotkeys. Let's talk a little bit about the construct window and what you're going to use it for. You're basically going to use it to import organize, categorize, and really get in and deal with any and all aspects of not only the footage itself, but the metadata information that comes along with it. Whether you're going to be importing EDLs or setting metadata settings here, 
this window is going to be your new best friend. Whether your footage is coming in for a dailies workflow, meaning individual clips, or whether your clips are being brought in as part of an XML, an AAF, or an EDL, this is where you're gonna find all of the footage and versions that you've created in this window in a very organized fashion. Now, you'll notice that we have these dividers down the screen. So I wonder how these work. Well, why don't we bring in some footage and take a look at that? Now you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, we have the project setup and the group that we're currently working in is the lowpost.com dailies group, okay? Keep that in mind, we're gonna talk more about groups in an upcoming lesson. But what I wanna do is I wanna come down and I want to import some clips. Now I'm just gonna grab Epic Adventures clips five through 10. I'll just hold shift on the keyboard to multi-select those clips. And I'm gonna come down and say open. Now you'll notice that I can bring these clips and take them and drop them in wherever I want them to go. What I'm gonna do is just line things up right about here and I'm gonna click on the interface. Once I do that, you'll now see that these clips have been dropped into their trays and we're now ready to start working with them. However, with that being said, What's also happened is, is that once I've taken these clips and dropped them into their trays, the edit module and the color effects module have now become available to us. Now you'll notice that within the construct window in the media section that we can also do our importing of AAFs, EDLs, and XML files, as well as having the ability to export Avid log exchanges right back to Media Composer. Now, we're gonna talk more about the construct window in its own dedicated lesson. So let's move ahead and let's talk about the edit module because I took these clips, dropped them into their trays, and now if I come to the edit module, you'll notice clip five, six, seven, eight, etc. Inside of our edit module, you'll notice there's clip five, six, seven, eight, etc., etc., dropped into our edit module. Now what's also important to keep in mind about what you see here is that this project that we're working in is a 38 by 40, 2160, 23.98 frame per second project. Okay, this is the original 4K project that we're working in. And we're gonna talk a little bit about of an example of what we can do to get this out of here towards the end of this lesson. Now, with the clips in our timeline, these are again not to be edited with just in a dailies workflow, we can come in, click on any one of the clips we want, hit play, and check them out. Okay, now if we decided that we wanted to do some color grading, we wanted to do some effects work, that's where we're gonna head to the color effects module. You'll see, we can get in and do primary color correction. We can come in and work with plugins, including third-party plugins. Any plugins that are supported for OFX can be used inside of Scratch. You'll see right now, we're working with Sapphire and Boris Effects Mocha. What I'm gonna do is I'm not going to apply anything. I'm just gonna cancel out of that because we also have the ability to work with LUTs, with masks, and with curves all from within this window. And again, we're gonna talk about this in its own dedicated lesson coming up shortly. All right, last but certainly not least, let's talk about the render module. Now, I think the easiest way to talk about the render module is to give you an example of a situation you might run into very early on working in Scratch. So I brought six clips in to the construct module that you then saw appear in our timeline. And I've gotten a call from a client in a dead panic saying they really need to see low res versions of those clips with burn in timecode as quickly as I can get it to them. So how would I go about doing this inside of Scratch? Well, one thing that you're gonna notice working in Scratch is it's very visual. Okay, now what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. What I'm gonna do is add a workflow to this timeline and I'm gonna use one of our dailies workflows. Now, I'm just gonna use the Avid one because we're just trying to create screening copies or low res copies of these clips. So I'm gonna apply this workflow to that timeline. Now you'll notice that what has happened is, is that a few other thumbnails have been added in, but what exactly do they represent? Well, what's gonna happen with our timeline? Very first thing is that burn in time code is going to be added to it before it is then taken and split off into two different workflows. Because this is a dailies workflow, I'm going to need to have low res DNX HD 36 media at 1920 by 1080. So what's gonna happen is Scratch is gonna take this clip or this timeline, it's gonna reframe it for HD and then compress it at DNX HD 36. 
Now remember I said that we didn't need that. All we want is that low res copy, that H.264 MP4 copy for the client to view. So all I'm gonna do is select this workflow and remove it. So now what Scratch is gonna do is it's gonna take the timeline, it's gonna burn in time code, it's gonna reframe it to 720p, it's gonna add that watermark, and then it's gonna take it and compress it into an H.264 MP4 file. Once we're happy with this workflow, what we're gonna do is simply come down, add it to the render queue, we're gonna call up the render queue, and with that timeline selected, I'm simply gonna come down and say start queue, and in a matter of seconds, those clips will be ready to upload to Dropbox or Google Drive or wherever the client needs them to be. Okay, I wanted to throw in this little bit of workflow at the end just to show you how simple it is to get in and to do what might seem like a fairly complex task relatively quickly and relatively easily. Now we're gonna again focus on all these modules and their own dedicated lessons, but I think this is a good place to leave off for today. And I hope what you've seen so far is that Scratch has two main selling features right off the bat. It is lightning fast, whether it's the application loading or how you're gonna work with it, you'll be able to get stuff done faster than you ever have before. And it's ease of use and just how everything just seems to make sense in its workflow is very refreshing and you see that even if you're a newcomer to Scratch, you'll be able to get in and start working with it very quickly and very easily. All right, now as always, if you have any questions, you have any comments or ideas for upcoming lessons or courses, I want you to head on over and post them in our forums at lowpost.com slash forums. And if you have any questions for me, you can always send them to Kevin P. McAuliffe at gmail.com.